Okay, welcome everyone to the first ever Renaissance Ranch Family Recovery Webinar. Uh, learning what to do when you don't know what to do. Just excited to be with you. Uh, we're we're our, your host, uh, my wonderful wife, Christy, and my name's Rick, and uh, I'm the chairman here at the Renaissance Ranch and owner with my two boys, uh, Preston and Tyson Dixon. Uh, again, just excited to be here with you. And uh, we, we know that many uh, have uh, just struggled with, uh, you know, maybe having a, a loving addict in your life, whether you're a parent that has a son or a daughter uh, or a spouse, maybe a, a brother or a sister, and uh, it's tough. It's uh, emotionally uh, gripping, and we want to validate your feelings. And today, we're here to give you some hope. And uh, we feel that the things that we'll be covering by our five speakers, that you will leave the room in which you are, are present, whether it's kitchen or a bedroom or a, a family room, you'll leave the threshold of that room different than how you came in. It will emotionally and spiritually change you by some of the things that will be shared. And in a minute, we're going to open it up with prayer to invite the spirit with us because we feel that's very, very important. But first off, let me, before I, we do that, just go through the agenda a little bit so you can see uh, what we're going to cover and who's going to cover it. Uh, our first speaker will be Dave Callister. He's our clinical director, and he'll be talking on how family members can best support their addicted loved one. Uh, second is our son, Tyson, who is the CEO of the ranch. He'll be uh, talking about how the disease aspect affects families. Our third uh, speaker will be my wonderful wife of 37 wonderful years. How can it be 30? You don't even look 37. How can it be 37 years? What a cutie. Now she'll be uh, uh, speaking on repairing relationships strained by addiction. And uh, our fourth speaker will be Lane Porter, who is our admissions director. How can I best encourage family or friends to get help for the, their addictions. And then I'll wrap it up as our first, uh, fifth speaker on uh, bringing peace in this struggle with addiction in your family. And afterwards, there will be substantial time for question and answers. And so make sure that you submit your questions and Christy will talk just a second on how to do that because this a lot of times will be the most valuable thing that you will receive is We'll have our panelists actually answer these questions live, and you will get to insight that will be um, very valuable. So with that, um, Christy, won't you share a couple things on the tech side, also how to uh, submit questions? Okay, sounds good. So just so you know, those of you, most of us are, are used to a Zoom room, and uh, webinars were kind of new to me. A couple of things to understand is, the video and the um, microphone are disabled because the webinar is like walking into an auditorium and maybe hearing some speakers. They're sitting up on the stage so you can see our, our panelists up there. And um, uh, so if you have questions, we want you to grab a notebook, maybe take some notes tonight on, on resources that you're learning and hearing about, and also any questions that you have for us. You should be able to go to the Q&A and type a question. And at the end, we just need your help because it's gonna be hard for us to remember everything. And we'll really appreciate questions to help us respond to things that maybe we're missing. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, one in four people in the United States have a relative very intimately close to them, a parent, a child, somebody very close with a substance abuse problem. And tonight we really want to extend some love and, and some hope to those of you who have a loved one uh, with addiction and may not quite be ready for help yet. We know that many of you have loved ones in treatment at the ranch and, and you're already involved in the journey and the miraculous gift of recovery. So um, uh, I wanted to show you really quickly, this is a list right here of over 25 evidence-based research studies in an article published by the Journal of Substance Abuse Treatment. And the studies all have one common theme, and that is that having support is critical 
to our loved ones in addiction, to help them get into treatment, stay in treatment, and maintain long-term sobriety post-treatment. There was a study funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse that said or suggests when family members engage in the recovery process along with their addicted loved one, it increases the likelihood of their loved one maintaining long-term sobriety, and that was defined as over one year by almost 70%. So at the ranch, we see huge success in the long-term outcomes of our clients who have family members who are attending our family education classes and are just willing to get knowledgeable about recovery and even attending outside 12-step or Al-Anon meetings. So some people may ask, well, what is family recovery and how does that relate to addiction? If we wanted to lose weight, we would probably search the internet to learn about nutrition, and exercise, we would maybe join a gym, we would seek out others who knew, or, who knew a little bit more about losing weight than we did. And it's the same thing with family recovery. Uh, we're desiring to show up to learn about how to best help our addicted loved ones and their families. And in the process, we learn how to help ourselves, our family, and the coolest thing is our recovery actions that have a ripple effect extending like a warm sunrise throughout all relationships in our lives. It's truly amazing. So we're so grateful and I'm grateful for uh, the opportunity to have a prayer tonight to ask the Holy Spirit to be with us. So good. Yeah. Did you touch on how they can actually sub submit questions? Yeah, there's a little Q&A. You should have a little Q&A function somewhere there on your screen and you should be able to type the questions in. And we'll look at that again as we get towards the end of, of um, the seminar tonight. So. Good deal. Okay, uh, uh, Tyson, our CEO, is going to give us our, um, uh, our opening prayer. And Ty, I see that you are uh, muted there. There you there go. Is. So uh, we're ready for a prayer. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Dear Father, we're... We're very thankful to be here this evening. Thankful um, for those that have uh, that have worked together to to make this webinar take place, and uh, especially thankful for um, for those that uh, are tuning in. and And we pray for each of them that they may um, have the answers shown unto them that they that they are seeking this night we pray that uh, those of us that speak can uh, speak with with your words that we might be able to fulfill your purposes and and help make a make an impact and um in this difficult uh battle of life that we're that we're on you know we're so thankful for the blessings of recovery, the reality of, of recovery, um, and for the, uh, um, that great uh, atoning sacrifice that fulfills the demands of justice that we may become new and, and whole and have new life. It's things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Thank, Thank you, Ty. Ty. Okay, our first speaker is our clinical director, uh, Dave Callister. Uh, Dave graduated from the University of Utah with a bachelor's degree in psychology and a master's degree in social work. In addition to his formal education, he's been in recovery from substance dependence since 1999. During his own struggle with addiction, Dave found um, light and purpose through the 12-step program and has been passionate about sharing the message of hope and healing ever since. He has worked with both youth, adults, and families suffering from addiction and mental illness at multiple programs including Lifeline for Youth, Lakeview Hospital, University of Utah Neuropsychiatric Neuropsych Institute, and Renaissance Ranch residential and outpatient programs. Aside from his work, Dave loves the outdoors, playing okay, golf, so my name is and uh, 
uh, spending time with families and listening to music and playing the guitar. So with that, let's go ahead and uh, uh, cue it up for, uh, for uh, Dave Callister. Dave? All righty, I'm just gonna share the screen here. Okay. Okay, so here we go. It's Dave Collister. I'm the clinical director of Renaissance Ranch, and I'm a recovering alcoholic and addict in, in long-term recovery. Um, I'm really grateful to be here tonight and to be able to speak to some things that are, I believe and feel very important for you as well as for your loved one. Christy invited me to share and, uh, some of my thoughts and feelings and gave a wide array a list of topics that we could choose from. And the topic that really resonated with me was how family members can best support their loved ones. Uh, that's a topic that's really close to home for me. And uh, because I had loved ones who were and are willing to engage in their own recovery process, uh, which I believe has accelerated my own recovery process and been very helpful to our entire family. Uh, and our healing process as a whole. So one thing I wanted to say is thank you for being here. Thank you for being willing to show up and participate in this family webinar. Um, there are so many drug addicts and alcoholics out there who don't have family members or who do have family members, but who are unwilling to get help, get education, look at their part, their contribution in this family systems disease, which is exactly what it is, and that's how we treat it and talk about it. Um, so the fact that you guys are all willing to show up, to dedicate and commit a, a portion of your week, uh, weekly schedule to, to engage in this process is, is both admirable and praiseworthy. Uh, let's face it, it's difficult to love a drug addict. Um, if you can't admit that, then you probably have some honesty work to do. Um, and I say that as, as an addict in recovery, I know that it can be difficult to love. So, so here's some bulleted items. I wanna go over a list very briefly and quickly and for a reason. So here's what you can do to best support your loved one. First and foremost, find an Al-Anon meeting and attend it regularly. Find a sponsor and work the 12 steps with a sponsor. You know, there's a, there's a very big difference between having an intellectual understanding, a conceptual understanding of the 12 steps, and actually implementing and working them with a sponsor. The difference is vast, it's significant, and, and it's life-altering. That difference is very important to acknowledge. Um, Learn about healthy boundaries, establish healthy boundaries. Uh, Brene Brown talks about boundaries using the acronym BIG, B-I-G. How can I maintain healthy boundaries, stay in my own integrity, and offer the most genuine assumptions about people that I love? Um, so learn boundaries, learn how to have healthy boundaries. One of the boundaries my mom and dad had with me, with me when I was in my addiction was, we love you, you're welcome in our home, Drugs and alcohol are not. If you bring drugs and alcohol into our home, you will have to leave. Um, another example that comes to mind, I was working with a, a, a grandmother of a, of a client and family group out in Farmington in Davis County. And she very emotionally, very sincerely, you know, tearfully crying said, you know, my grandson said he was going to commit suicide if I didn't give him money to buy a car. This is a true story. And she was beside herself and, and she said, what do I do? A boundary is not going to work there. And, and with all the urgency with which suicidal ideation deserves, what I told her was, here's what a good boundary would sound like. Sweetie, I hope you don't. I hope you choose to stay, but I'm not giving you money for a car. Um, that's speaking truth with love. It's honoring a boundary. And
Christy, I think we've lost audio. Hi guys, somehow we lost the audio. Okay, let's pause okay. that. Okay, sorry about that, you guys. I understand we've lost the audio. Is that correct, Blaine? Yes, but we can hear, it's the video we can't hear. You, um, we can hear each other and they can probably hear us. Just oh, nobody just, can hear the video. Did it just stop? It, yeah, yeah the video stopped. just went silent. It's about 30 seconds ago, Dad. Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe one minute total ago oh. or less. Okay, let me let me uh, let me go ahead and stop the share, and I'll start it again and see if it can resume. Okay, okay. and I can see that I'm at five eleven. Thanks, you guys. We're going to have a little hiccups. I knew that would happen, but thanks for being kind and patient with us. So let me stop the share. All right, and then I've got this on. Let's go ahead and start the share again. Start the screen. Uh, share my screen for the participants just so everyone knows this is the only pre-recorded segment Dave's very busy uh, and uh, so just wanted everything else will be live all the other speakers um, are live thanks Pat. oh yes thank you so much okay so let's give this a try little interruption with the dogs and the HVAC guys um, so but that was a good segue uh, so in review, find and attend an al -Anon meeting, work the steps with a sponsor, learn about and establish healthy boundaries, learn about enabling and see where you are currently enabling your loved one. Okay. And then the, the fifth point, speak the truth plainly with love. Now, part of that involves get help seeing your own lives. Everyone that's involved in a family system of alcoholism is telling themselves and others lies. These are not always easy to identify and see. And that's why working the steps with a sponsor is so critical because that person can help you see your own lies. Um, and they exist. I assure you they exist. And there's no shame in acknowledging that. It takes, it takes boldness and courage to acknowledge where you are telling lies and begin to tell the truth with love. Truth is the healing agent and power in recovery. It's truth. Um, so a couple personal experiences. Uh, when I was in treatment, I had gone through residential treatment. Uh, I was court ordered. You know, the judge signed a, signed a form that said I had to do treatment. So I did unwillingly initially and then became more willing. Um, had a life-changing spiritual experience at the treatment center that I attended, um, working the 12 steps and uh, coming to a knowledge that, that I was worthy, that I was lovable, that I was okay with who I am. Um, and that was a long process. Towards the end of that, I was in an intensive outpatient program and I was driving, my dad was driving me to group um, at the time, he was Bishop Collister. Uh, I joke sometimes I'm a recovering son of a bishop, and I say that with a lot of love. Um, today, part of my recovery is, is my faith. It's my religion. It's my relationship with my creator, with my savior. Those are who I identify as my higher power today. And that's a, that's a big part of my recovery. It wasn't initially the case. Um, and I share this story to illustrate a, an important point. So my dad was Bishop Collister at the time, and we were driving to treatment. And I, I looked at him and I said, Dad, I have a really serious conversation and question I have to ask you. And he could sense my urgency. And he pulled the car to the side of the road. And I said, you know, our relationship matters to me. Um, what I'm, I'm really fearful that if I choose not to be active in the church, if I choose not to serve an LDS mission, um, I'm worried that that's going to impact my relationship with you. And without missing a beat, my dad, my dad got it right. Here's a concept. Do you want to be right or do you want to get it right? Um, as parents, often we have to focus on getting it right. 
or as spouses rather than being right. My dad got it right that night and he said, Dave, you clearly have light in your life today. Uh, you're clearly engaged in something that has purpose and meaning to you. I can see that it's undeniable. And he said the following, he said, our relationship transcends dogma. Our relationship is far more important to me than your worship in a church. And this is from Bishop Collister. Um, I get the chills right now sharing that. I love my dad. We have a wonderful relationship today. And I believe this critical juncture was part of that. He spoke the truth with love. He honored uh, my agency and my recovery process. He didn't try to control it. He didn't try to give me advice. He listened and he shared his love and perspective. Um, to feel that our connection and relationship was that important to him um, was healing for me. It was healing for me. And of course, I'm, I'm <laughs> oppositionally defiant, rebellious, you know, pushing against the, the mores and norms to find myself. In that moment, I had a change of heart and, and I thought and felt and experience, you know, I think I'm going to go on a mission and, and I'm going to explore this stuff for myself. I share that story not to illustrate or, or claim that activity in the church equals success in treatment, because that's not always the case. But for me, that's part of my story and journey. And I'm grateful that my dad had enough recovery tools and foundational knowledge and understanding about the steps about codependency to to get it right and really be in the spirit of that moment for me uh, i believe it altered my life forever um, so so the other experience that i would wrap up with is is a very ancient story I think we lost the uh, audio again, Christy and, and Rick. So about 20 seconds ago and counting. Do something crazy, Lane. Do, 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 do. There it is. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Technical difficulties. <laughs> Still out. Still out. Okay. okay, sorry about that, you guys. I'll have to figure out why that, that kept stopping. But the rest of us are live, so we're so excited. Good, good. That was awesome. You know, um, he, was just, he was just wrapping up. But what I loved about what he said was uh, the first thing he said that had great impact for me is that the healing process was accelerated for him when his family members engaged in their own recovery his healing was accelerated. And you know, as I thought back, that is exactly what happened with our family. When we engaged in recovery, our boys, it helped healing in an exponential way. Oh, huge. You know, it was just amazing. Uh, and then he mentioned uh, uh, several things that uh, to do to support your loved one in addiction. Uh, the three or four that really stood out <clears throat> to me was uh, attending an addiction recovery 12-step meeting, an Al-Anon meeting, an ARP meeting, a 12-step meeting, and, and use a, a, and find a sponsor as soon as possible. Very powerful. And he's talked about establishing healthy boundaries, which are critical. And then what enabling is and are we enabling? Very important. And then uh, 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 speak the truth with love. Very powerful. So 
Uh, we appreciate Dave. He just uh, recorded that a few days ago because he was back-to-back uh, -to -back today, but we're just grateful that he was able to do that. And again, our, 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 the, next, uh, our, the rest of our speakers are live, and we're uh, excited about that. So uh, I'd like to, to now introduce uh, my son, Tyson. Uh, Tyson, as I mentioned before, is the Chief Executive Officer of the Renaissance Ranch. He has a bachelor's degree in psychology and is an advanced substance use disorder counselor. As an addict in long-term recovery, Tyson went through Renaissance Ranch as a patient nearly 12 years ago and has been clean and sober ever since. He has a deep passion for helping those to recover from the disease of addiction and proving hope to all who suffer. His primary job as CEO is to work hand in hand with all facets of running the ranch and primarily to ensure that the ranch functions at the highest possible level, incorporating any and all things good that will give our ranch brothers the absolute best shot at real, genuine, lasting change. He is a proud husband and father of three of the cutest kids on the planet, and I can attest to that. So with that, let's turn it over, and it's my honor to turn it to Tyson, my son. Thanks, Ty. Thanks, Dad. Uh, thank you, everybody, for, uh, for tuning in. Um, <clears throat> as was mentioned, I had the opportunity of going through Renaissance Ranch um, uh, years ago, and um, 12 years ago. And uh, it, it, it changed my life. It, it wasn't the first treatment facility that, that I had ever been to, um, but it was the last, uh, luckily. Um, but I, uh, <clears throat> uh, through my, my process, there was a lot that was going on in my, my brain um, that, I did, that I wasn't aware of at the time. Um, and what I primarily wanted to, uh, focus, uh, my words on today were the realities of the disease of addiction and uh, what that means. Um, <clears throat> and so <clears throat> a bit before I, I was able to go to the ranch, uh, I, first sp uh, spent some time um, in the Salt Lake County Jail and um, was really disgusted with myself, who I had become, um, what, um, you know, was uh, coming off the substances I was on, I came to a realization of, um, of acute pain physically and emotionally. Um, like uh, like I had woken up from a dream uh, into uh, a nightmare, and um, you know I when when you're in a, a cell for 23 hours a day, you have a lot of time to think about uh, think about things, and you have, and, <laughs> um, and <clears throat> I remember just being filled with. Uh, so much, uh, so much despair, uh, so much um, hopelessness, because <clears throat> I felt like that's that's how I was going to continue to uh, exist. That's that's how uh, this is where my life is. This is who I, who I am today. But, but knowing that that's not who I was, and that uh, underneath it all, but really. I mean, coming to this place of, well, I guess this is how homeless people are homeless. And, um, you know, uh, um, this is how people end up in prison and, and um, so much emotional pain that I wanted to, I wanted to take my life pretty desperately. Um, I, I, I couldn't, I didn't have an effective way to do that. Um, thank God in, in jail. Um, but I, I was at this, place of pitiful and uncomprehensible demoralization um, and <clears throat> you know faced with all of these horrific consequences right 
Um, my, my parents didn't want me around. Um, my, my friends didn't want me around. Um, I had failed relationships, a girlfriend that didn't want me around. Um, all these broken relationships uh, and, and all this wreckage, carnage behind me. And, and I was utterly alone, utterly alone. And <clears throat> I had, you know, I, I had attempted to go to college, you know, flunked out, couldn't do it, backed out um for you know went to college for i tried for a semester um and uh you know i'm a 19 year old year old kid raised in draper utah with good parents as you can see uh but um filled with filled with shame and and guilt uh, for never measuring up and never um and and being where where i was um <clears throat> And you would think that all of those horrific consequences of, of using drugs and alcohol, you would think that that would be enough and that I would, um, I, I would quit. Um, <clears throat> but I wanted more than anything in the world uh, to use any opiate of any kind um, so badly with the, because of the acute physical pain I was in and the acute emotional pain I was in. And I had become so physiological, physiologically dependent on substances to make me feel okay, to make me, uh, what, what, what I have come to understand what was going on in my brain at that time. You see, when you put a, any, any drug or alcohol, anything that causes uh, causes a high. So your brain, your brain naturally makes these chemicals, endorphins, serotonin, dopamine, uh, natural opiates, your brain makes this stuff. This, uh, that's what enables us to regulate pain in our bodies naturally to uh, help us to fall asleep. Um, it, it regulates mood and emotional stability, right? Well, what happens when you put in alcohol or drugs is you get this excess dopamine and, and serotonin and, and, and so forth. Well, when you use hard drugs, the more dopamine, the more serotonin. And what, what happens is <clears throat> your brain says, okay, we don't need to, to manufacture uh, these, these opiates anymore. We're getting them from outside sources. We don't need to manufacture these chemicals because we're getting them from alcohol or marijuana or, or what have you. So the brain um, starts shutting down production in certain areas. And, and the more substances that are used and the more severe, um, the more of the production the more is shut down, the more the, the factories, if you will, are shut down. And there's not a lot, if any, in storage of natural dopamine, opiate, serotonin in your, in your brain. So when you stop using or you're clean for, for, oh, for, for Lord forbid, five hours, your, your brain turns, to, turns on itself, says, I don't have any of these feel-good chemicals. I need to drink or use or whatever it is so that I can exist, so that I can, uh, so I can survive. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, uh, w what I found was going on in my brain, um, was uh, looking back, I'm like, well, that makes sense, you know? And so in, in recovery, in, in my schooling, um, since, um, after I got sober, I was actually able to stay in school and engage and do reasonably well, believe it or not. But, um, <laughs> I, I, in psychology, it's really neat. It's really broad. And so they let you kind of pick what school of psychology you want to go into. And I, and I really chose to focus on writing a majority of my papers on addiction and addiction recovery and, 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 and everything around that. And a big factor of that was, uh, was the disease model, you know, and I, and I re researched it a lot, wrote a lot of papers. It was massive for me in my own, own recovery because it really helped me make sense of my, my past. <clears throat> now, I want everyone to hear me very loud and clear that 
understanding addiction as a disease does not mean that the, that the behavior is okay. It doesn't absolve an addict of their, of their decisions or their behavior. Oh, they're just a disease. Oh, like, like, let's let them keep it. No. Um, it's meant to explain the insanity, explain the behavior. It's helped to bring awareness and understanding to us so that we can have compassion and empathy and, and understand we're dealing with a sick person that needs to get well, not a bad person that just needs to quit. Um, <clears throat> or a sick, even a sick person that needs to quit. This is a, this is a, when, when we change the way that we look at things, like our loved ones, the, the things we look at change. In my perception, that's the whole concept of this family webinar. When the family members change the way they look at the addict, then the, the addict changes. Um, that was my experience um, with my parents, like what was suggested about a month into my treatment. I'll never forget the talk I had with my father, um, who we had a horrible relationship up until then, if you can imagine. I mean, a, a lying, thieving uh, son who had completely lost his way and was felt, felt entitled to the world and uh, was given the world um, and uh, so forth. <clears throat> but my father said to me, you know, he said, Tice, I'm learning that I have so much of my own stuff that I'm just going to go ahead and let you recover and, and I, but I need to recover. But furthermore, I remember him saying, I'm very, very proud of you, son, for just being in treatment, being willing to fight. Um, learning about addiction has been extraordinary. I mean, it's been crazy for me. Uh, I had no idea of what you were up against and what's been going on in your brain, in your heart. Um, I did, had no idea of my issues. Um, and, and, and I need to get, I need to get some freaking help said my dad, end quote, you know, and, um, that was, that was, um, pretty big for me because up until then, my father had never done anything wrong, said anything wrong. Um, especially according to him. So for, for him to even allude to the fact that, uh, and, and plainly state that he had a great deal to work on, um, was, was, was huge for me. Um, and huge for, for our relationship. Um, and we've had many great talks and grown very, very close. And we're, we're, best, we're best friends today. And I love spending time um, with my dad and my mom today um, where, where I really wanted to do quite the opposite um, in my disease. <clears throat> and so um, our, our family... Um, is a big believer in, in recovery and the principles and the happiness that it can restore in, in our lives. Um, <clears throat> you know, for the, the few minutes I have left, I'll, I want to break down the disease a, a little bit um, simply, as, as simply as, as I can, um, the way that I've come to understand it um, and, and uh, through my research and personal experience and, and working with um, uh, hundreds of other uh, addicts and, and their families. Um, <clears throat> so in considering addiction, we, there are, um, there's two, uh, two major causes. There's the environmental factors and then there's the biological factors. Um, biological factors are pretty simple. Um, that's just our genetics. Um, and we, we don't have a lot of control over that. My great grandfather was an alcoholic. So when I started using drugs and alcohol, my genetics said, yep, that's it. That's what you need to survive. Uh, keep doing that. It is good. That's what my genetics communicated to me. <clears throat> now, it doesn't take just genetics. Um, it, that, that can be a definite trigger. But to develop the disease, again, it's, it's, it's a process that is developed in somebody. Um, and we absolutely make the choice to use drugs and alcohol. We make that choice. Um, and 
what ends up happening if someone has a genetic predisposition to the disease and has all the em environmental factors. Let's talk about the second factor real quick. The environmental factors are the family that, that you're raised in, you know, the socioeconomic status, um, the um, any tr in trauma that you, you may have experienced, um, and um, just basically everything that your, your whole perception of yourself and the world around you uh, and the people you've had around you. Um, <clears throat> You know, in uh, in my case, um, being um, being raised LDS and in, in raised in a, in a shame based family system. That's what we what we had is a shame based family system, an emotionally dishonest family system. Um, even though we didn't we didn't think so. Um, shame is extraordinarily subtle, and is if you've been raised with it, which in my experience, many people in, in any religious, a lot of religious cultures are raised with it and it becomes really a part of, um, a part of doing, um, there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of judgment and self judgment and judgment on others and, and a desire to, um, be good enough so that one can, can be good enough for God. Uh, or at least that was my experience. Um, <clears throat> good enough to get help from from a creator, um, and and so this concept of that I need to purify myself, and then I can then I can get help from God. That's kind of what that's kind of what I thought. That's how I, I thought I thought God worked. Um, <clears throat> I'm glad I was very wrong about that. The pro, the whole point of the atonement in my perspective is to help meet us in our sickness, in our, in our sin, if you will, in our weakness and to, and to lead us um, piece by piece out of that um, and to give us the strength and the know-how when we when we completely lack it. Um, and the only price is, is humility and willingness to ask for that help and admit that we cannot do it on our own you know and that's very ca uh, counterintuitive to the culture um that we're raised in and, and we and then we live in um uh really as, as, as human beings so my my environmental factors um were that but you know i also wanted to my personality i wanted to fit in um more than anything i wanted to be cool and was willing to do anything to do so so when the cool kids were using drugs and alcohol. So, so was I, my genetics responded, my env environmental shame factors kicked in and you know, the stars kind of just lined up for old Tyson Dixon to, to develop this disease uh, as quick as possible. And so at 18 years old, I, I'm in the Salt Lake County jail, 18 or 19. Um, <clears throat> I mean, cause I've been to, I've been to jail about 10 times. Um, in many spurts, but just was a, uh, uh, a, a reject to society, um, to, to say the least, uh, a taker, uh, a real, real taker, selfish and self-centered to, um, to the extreme, um, and, and led me to, to ultimate and dramatic unhappiness. Um, <clears throat> but it was everybody else's fault and not mine. And, um, and uh, if, if everybody would just let me use drugs and alcohol the way that I wanted to, the way I needed to, everything would be fine. So what's the problem? You know, um, I was sick. I was a sick man that needed, that needed to get well. And, and luckily I got help before I died um, or, or worse or, or really hurt, hurt others worse and, and did, uh, did what we do is continue to cause destruction. So, uh, I, in, in, in considering those fa factors, let's also consider the, the human brain, just two parts of the brain. Um, or I'm going to talk about are the, the amygdala or in the midbrain and the prefrontal cortex. Um, in the, uh, what, what these parts of the brain, the amygdala, the midbrain, essentially, that's the same part, the same brain that all animals have. 
it is um, what enables us to survive as a spe as a human as a, as a as a living being. Um, the um, so um, the um, you need to stop. Let me just try taking this out. <laughs> um, so the uh, um, the the midbrain is the primitive part of the brain and it is is the fight or flight it's the part of the brain that, that tells uh tells us to breathe if, if you look at the core needs that we have it's food water and, and air um and, and and shelter really um but the physiologically food food water and air if you take one of those away you're going to do anything and everything to obtain it right i mean if 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 you don't have water you're going to do anything and and you've got food and and or um uh, and air you're going to do anything to get water if if you have food and water and no air you don't last long you're going to spend that 30 seconds or or 90 seconds doing anything and everything you can to get air um period you're you, you know um <clears throat> how how i like to explain it is you know when you dive off a high dive and you're you've let all the air in your lungs out you're the bottom of the pool looking up and you're out of air um and you're down there and your lungs are screaming in for oxygen and, and you're doing everything that you can to get up to get air um you're not thinking about problems in relationships or anything like that you're not thinking about uh anything um but getting air. So <clears throat> what, in my experience, what happens in the brain, in the amygdala, is we develop an additional survival need, just like food, water, and air. Food, water, air, drugs. Uh, drugs or alcohol. So we, we eventually grow this. It starts out small as a seed, and as we continue to use and continue to have uh, different things happen when we use or things that we do and we got to use more And the brain just carves out these these neural pathways to the point of it, the seed now is this massive oak tree as big as the the oak tree of air water and food and so <clears throat> if you have food water and shelter and you don't have drugs you're going to do everything that you can to get those those drugs um, the prefrontal cortex in the brain, that's our logical reasoning part of our brain. That's the part of the brain that separates us from all other animals and enables us to be the dominant species on earth. And we only even access just a small portion of that. But this is the part of the brain where our uh, emotional health comes in, um, our, our emotional maturity, mental maturity, uh, our ability to comprehend consequences, everything. Um, but what happens when the, in a diseased brain, when it gets to that point is that part of the brain virtually shuts off and the host lives out of the midbrain and where that part of the brain is communicating to the host that they need their drugs just as bad as they need food, water, or air. But we have this conflict, this real moral dilemma in when, when we're engaged in our disease, because you see the prefrontal cortex isn't turned off all the way. We still have all our memories of how we used to be and how we used to be able to manage our drinking and using, how we used to be able to handle life. And <clears throat> we justify and rationalize um, to, to continue Content to continue that life and the disease just goes stronger and more powerful. Um, so uh, the American Medical Association has deemed addiction a disease. So it's not not really a um, not really a topic for um, you know debate. It's it's a scientific fact. Um, you know uh, that <clears throat> because it, it falls into the disease model in that it must be uh, for something to be categorized as a disease it must be chronic reoccurring so chronic and, and and progressive 
So it's got to just get worse over time and if and fatal, which if untreated, that's ultimately where 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 it goes. Um, <clears throat> so these consequences that we experience, these consequences are um, very, very real, but they're not as as powerful as as our disease them, themselves. Um, I, uh, um, I'm, so I'm out of time. Um, uh, hopefully that was helpful. Thanks. All right. Yeah. Okay. Um, very well done, Tyson. Thank you so much. Um, you know, it was interesting. There's two key points that really uh, hit me. Uh, when he was incarcerated, um, I thought it was the worst thing that could happen. But you know what? This is a good thing many times because the consequence, the, the, the pain of the consequent is felt and uh, an addict can come to themselves. So that was the first thing that I thought was very, very helpful. And then the, the discussion on the brain disease of addiction. You know, an addict in their addiction, they're not a bad person uh, that needs to be better. They are sick needing healing. And uh, I just love the, the understanding of that this is a, 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 a brain disease. Well, very, very powerful. Uh, next speaker, just excited to introduce my wonderful wife, Christy, uh, who is a family uh, educated, educating co coordinator here at the, uh, at the ranch. Um, let me just read a little bit about her. Uh, she has a bachelor's in speech communication education with Brigham Young University and is currently pursuing a marriage and family therapy master's degree. She's almost 60 years young and she's in her master's. How about that one? <laughs> Just so proud of her, I can't stand it. She's the mother of our five children. We have 11 grandchildren, number 12 is on the way, and her two oldest sons are in long-term recovery from multiple substances that led to heroin and opiate addiction. Years ago, she was called by her church and the church, which is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, to serve as a service missionary with her husband, facilitating 12-step meetings in their addiction recovery program in the county jail, state prison, and local churches, and has been doing this now for almost 15 years. Christy says she has now become addicted to the uh, uh, addicted and has uh, facilitated with her husband in over 900 recovery 12-step meetings and heard stories from hundreds and hundreds of people suffering from the effects of addiction. She's been a family educator at the ranch for now about eight years. Her greatest passion and drive in life includes her faith in God, her marriage, her family, hiking in the mountains and helping families suffering from addiction find peace and joy in family recovery. We'll turn the time now over to Christy. Christy? Well, thanks so much. Hey, I'm so, so grateful for this opportunity to speak to you guys tonight. And sorry, earlier we lost a little bit of the video and appreciate Jana, one of our attendees, explaining this because I was muting my microphone. So that's my first learning experience with these webinars so appreciate your patience tonight but i i hope you can all see me okay and hear me okay um there's so much in my heart that i want to share that i had to kind of record my or write down my my thoughts so if my eyes aren't quite where they need to be bear, bear with me but yeah so about 15 years ago the boys were really struggling we had five kids at the time and the only advice I got from a friend at my church was to start attending their 12-step program. And you know what? Absolutely has been the best resource I have ever found to find peace for myself, my relationship with my husband's, my marriage, um, my whole family. It's just been a wonderful journey. And, um, and truly, every one of those 12 steps, I work them every day in my life. They become a part of me. I feel like they're like the gospel of Jesus Christ, just organized so perfectly. And um, it's, it's, it's been uh, just like one of the best things I've done for my relationships as well. So really, I could take you through every single step and say, work that one-on-one -on -one with God 
and you will totally find uh, you know how to improve and, and strengthen your relationships but I really want to focus on repairing relationships specifically with our loved ones in addiction and because I only have 15 minutes I'll focus on the principles and then if you'd like to learn more just want to invite you to join our weekly family education classes they're online they're a click away they are uh, fantastic we have amazing educators and we actually help work those 12 steps and when they we include topics and themes that are specific to family members um, you know like how to set uh, boundaries how to you know working on relationships communication skills problem solving skills uh, it's just a it's a wonderful resource and, and it's free it's free and it's open to the public so we're about helping families because we know addiction is 100 percent a family illness and affects everybody in the family so um rick and i are witnesses as you've heard over the last 15 years we've attended you know well over a thousand actually meetings and then the last eight years we've met with family members with the ranch every week with family addiction so we are literal witnesses that when one family member engages in recovery and support it, it really starts to change the paradigm of the whole family i mean there's a huge shift so change begins and it's positive and hopeful and proactive and you feel that momentum and it feels so wonderful. Um, so talking about the quality of our relationships, it's, it's, uh, it's defined first by our personal beliefs, you know, where we are at that particular time in our lives and how we perceive or view the other person that we're wanting a relationship with. And I really love what Tyson and Dave shared with the relationships that they had. And I love how Mother Teresa said, if you judge people, there's little time to love them. And I know that um, I'm grateful Tyson talked about the disease aspect because I truly believe that was the number one most important thing that my husband and I could learn because once we understood addiction was a disease, it took away the judgment and it increased uh, just a desire and a hunger in us to find help and treatment for our sons. And so uh, until then, you know, they, I think we, I really believe we can feel the attitude that people have towards us. And I'm sure that they were feeling that judgment and they didn't feel safe. So in recovery, we help our loved ones to feel safe so that they can be their authentic selves and we can connect on that beautiful, level that we all need. And I just want to remind everybody that in 2011, the Addiction Society of Addiction Medicine, they did adopt a new definition of addiction based on four years of intense study by 80 experts. And they say that addiction is a chronic brain disease, not just bad behaviors or bad choices. And that's why insurance companies are willing to help pay for treatment today and can you guys imagine having a disease that prompts you to actions that you cannot stop regardless of horrific consequences can you just imagine that so this new information about disease for us back in the day it changed our perception and our view of our loved ones and we now didn't see them as a bad person who needed to be good but a sick person who needed appropriate help to become well so um that's that first step of just be willing to learn more about what your loved one is, is dealing with second step is that we humbly approach god you know our higher power who for me um that's Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. But we become willing to approach our higher power to help us see our part in relationship conflict. And a wise man said, it's easy to see the mistakes of others, but almost impossible to see our own imperfections and mistakes. So Jesus Christ taught a parable of the moat and the beam. And it's really the essence of recovery in our relationships. He said to first remove the beam from our own eye first, and then we can see clearly to help our neighbor. So what's interesting in the many, many uh, meetings that we've had an opportunity to sit in on is 
to hear the stories of the addicted and sharing, you know, what it is that's caused them to use and abuse and relapse so much with addiction. And the number one, number one cause that they state is relationship conflict. And almost always the relationships that they're talking about is the spouse or the parent relationship. And uh, what's really interesting is if we ask family members the same question, you know, what's the number one thing that causes you to resort to these negative codependent behaviors? Almost always with them, it's relationship conflict with my addicted loved one. So there's a huge need for the family member and those who struggle with addiction to understand how to repair and manage relationship conflict. And so um, Al-Anon has a really why Al-Anon is, by the way, the family program for Alcoholics Anonymous. It's the, it's the longest standing program to support family members. And their literature is amazing, but they have a slogan that I love about this that just says simply, let it begin with me. I love that. Um, so as human beings, we all want to love and be loved. And when addiction comes into our relationships, we do find ourselves adopting some negative coping skills like denial, emotional dishonesty. I know for me as a codependent, Tyson talked about a shame-based family system. Codependents typically have a really hard time expressing their feelings. You know, um, it's easier just to kind of shove it under the rug and not talk about it. But we also develop uh, negative coping skills such as uh, trying to control, fix, or save our loved ones. Um, and these behaviors start to drive a wedge in our relationships and we feel more and more disconnected from our loved ones. So the bottom line is addiction strains relationships, but recovery strengthens relationships. And one of the best tools I know of to strengthen myself and my relationship is to work particularly step eight and nine in the 12-step recovery program. Those are the relationship steps to make amends, to strengthen um, those ties and to promote healthy interaction. I love that. So when you think about the term relationship repair, what does that mean to you? Um, the desire to repair a relationship is rooted in an acknowledgement that we have maybe caused some harm. And family members in recovery learn that we are only responsible for fixing and saving ourselves. We learn how to focus on cleaning up our side of the street and let go of controlling the actions of others. And I'm reminding myself even right now, giving unsolicited advice. So pretty much all of our efforts to save our loved ones from addiction have left us as family members pretty powerless. And we find a huge burden is taken off of our shoulders when we learn through working our steps of recovery, particularly step three, how to let, how to let go and let God. It's my favorite step. So in recovery, we have this acronym of how to recover. It's honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. And those three things we can apply to our relationships. And, and humility, just the willingness to apply that acronym. Honesty, H, openness, and willingness is really, really helpful. Um, one of the best principles to get back to neutral ground when we're messing up with our relationships with addiction is, uh, is a sincere apology. You heard Dave and my husband talk about that, how that impacted uh, the father-son relationship. Uh, two of the best worlds to default to when we're wanting to rebuild rocky relationships is, I'm sorry, a sincere apology. That humility, that emotional repentance can do so much to soften and, and unify hurting hearts. Uh, three of the most healing words to default to after those two are, I love you. I remember um, that just that impact has, has been so great in the relationship my husband and sons have. And I also learned in recovery that I'm not responsible for the relationship of my husband and sons. I'm only responsible for the relationship that I have with my higher power and with the people close to me in my life. 
The third thing that I want to share is to attend 12-step meetings with people in addiction. That's what my husband and I did. Uh, we started attending meetings, and then we would go home and share with our sons all the things we were learning. And I think that helped them to feel safe to share where they were at and to become honest with us with um, the trials that they were facing. The fourth step is come to understand how shame is the core center of addiction. And as family members become knowledgeable of our behaviors that trigger shame. And my husband's gonna talk a lot about that. And then if you don't hear enough, join us in our classes. Because this is the second most important thing that I ever learned, was that I needed to look at how I was shaming my sons. And a big antidote for that is a big dose of validation and empathy. I remember validation doesn't mean that we agree with what our loved ones are doing, but we're willing to sit with them. And we're willing to try to help them understand that uh, we love them and that we, we can um, validate their feelings and help them understand that um, we can separate what their, their actions from their choices. So validation is huge and it feels so good to have someone, I know for me to sit down with me and help me feel loved and accepted, you know, so that's really important. <coughs> uh, the fifth thing is to stop giving unsolicited advice. We talked about that and we want to focus on the good in others. Often with addiction, we get kind of stuck in focusing on, you know, the, the smaller bad and we forget the bigger good, right? It's kind of like, driving up to the Grand Canyon in our car, we see this beautiful panorama of all this good with the Grand Canyon. We kind of get stuck focusing on the black fly on the windshield. And so when we can start focusing on the good in our loved ones and reminding them of the good in themselves, that pulls them out of that shame and it promotes a willingness for them to get help. Because when they're stuck in shame, that's all they can see is the bad in themselves. So we really need to encourage and remind them of the good. The sixth thing is to refrain, refrain. Once our loved ones get into treatment, I want to just talk, talk real quick about a couple of things here. We need to refrain from policing our loved one's recovery and focus on our own recovery. So the best thing I learned that I can do for my loved ones is to work on my own, my own recovery from my codependent, crazy, trying to fix uh, control your behaviors. Nobody likes to be a project, right? Um, so when, I, when our loved ones go into treatment and we're working our own recovery program, the relationship starts to heal. And it's, and like I said, it's really important that we focus on our own growth and we give our loved ones the dignity and the space to, to um, recover in their own timetable. It's a good thing that God's in charge of that because there's, there's meaning and there's purpose in the pain and what they're going through. And in fact, the consequences are the only thing that's gonna help them break through that brain disease and recognize that they even have a problem and that they need help. So we need to learn that fine line between what's helpful and hurtful and allow the consequences whenever possible. And then with relapse, you know, I was so afraid of that word. That is a part of the process of recovery. And when our loved ones slip up, it's so important that we put our arms around them, give them a ton of love, help them understand they have not lost any of the tools of recovery, but yet they are uh, there in that point because there's something new to learn. And just encourage them you know, to dig back in and, and to um, be happy about discovering what it is that they have to learn. Uh, last thing I wanna share is to never give up. I love Stephen R. Covey's comment that successful families are families who never give up. And there's a beautiful book, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Successful Families. I couldn't get off that book for over a year. I just kept going back and back to it. It's really, really powerful. If you have a spouse with addiction, please wait at least a year to make any decisions about leaving that relationship because often people who choose recovery end up far better than the person they were when they started recovery. So please be willing to be patient. And, and man, we see, we pe see people become so much better. Next, get educated by getting involved in recovery groups and then work your recovery daily. For me, that is daily prayer, meditation with scripture study 
and my 12 steps. And it's kind of like the scriptures tell me why and, 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 and why I need to change. And it's like the 12 steps are a workbook of how to change. It's, it's amazing. Um, and the last thing is just practice recovery principles in all our relationships. Like you just showing up tonight and making a decision to learn, you are the best example now for your family in recovery. And God will bring people into your life that you can help and it will bless your life. I know for me, again, it has been the best uh, information that I have ever learned to heal emotionally, spiritually, physically, and my relationships. Love you all so much and look forward to talking to you in the Q&A. All right. Good Thank job, honey. So I'll slide back in here. <laughs> Isn't she amazing? Just an awesome gal. You know, a couple of things that, that I just love what you said, uh, and I've heard you say this before, but the moat and the beam principle. You know, what's interesting with me is, is, is our boys were in their addiction. It was really easy. Uh, to see their problems, to see their issues, to see their life falling apart. But, you know, what I found in my own recovery is that I had a two by four plank, uh, the moat, or I should say the beam, and it was hard. I had to help remove that before I could really see things clearly. And that's uh, partly what um, recovery did for me. And also, I love what you talked about, as you says, um, you know, as we attended, as a couple, as we attended, 12-step meetings, we found serious healing uh, and, and just, just yeah. peace and comfort. It was mm -hmm. powerful. Honey, thank you so much. That was, that was just awesome. All right. <clears throat> Our next speaker, I'm just so excited to, um, to introduce uh, Lane Porter. He's our admissions director, and he is a powerhouse, uh, a, uh, an addict in, in long-term recovery, um, and just a, a neat, neat guy. Let me just share a little bit about uh, Lane. Um, Lane is an experienced director and therapist with an accomplished history of working in the substance use disorder and mental health care industry as a clinical director, owner, therap therapist admissions director, chief executive officer. He is skilled in CBT, REBT, and motion, motivational enhancement therapies, anger management, community mental health, adjustment disorder, and substance use disorder. He is a developed professional with an MS, Masters of Science of Counseling, focused in mental health counseling from University of Phoenix. He is licensed as a CMHC in the state of Utah. He has held national board certifi certifications from the NBCC as a national certified counselor and a master's addiction counselor. In his current role as an admissions director with Renaissance Ranch, he specializes in assisting the families and friends of addicted individuals with motivating their loved ones into treatment. This guy is literally the man, the legend, and now the book. <laughs> <laughs> Let's turn it over to Lane Porter. You're on, Lane. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much, Rick and Christy. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly let me just start off by thanking all of you for, uh, for coming and participating in this webinar. Um, uh, it, is, it is a well-known and well-regarded fact in, in the, uh, the field that social capital and specifically supportive family, friends, and relationships is, is uh, categorically and historically one of the best predictors of attaining and maintaining recovery. Supportive and healthy family members directly improve the prognosis of this disease. So good job, you guys. Way to be here. Um, I know it's not easy. Now, as I have um, as I have looked at kind of the roster and looked at the names, I recognize a lot of the names and many of you I've worked with. I think a lot of you have um, maybe gotten the uh, advice and the information that I'm going to share today. Uh, I think it bears repeating. Um, as Tyson and his mom both shared, um, the disease of addiction is a chronic relapsing disease. Um, and that does not mean that relapse is part of recovery. Please understand that. It means relapse is part of the disease and the sickness. And so it does happen. Relapse does not have to be part of recovery. 
Um, so that's important to clarify. But what I, the reason I clarified that is there is a chance that the skills and the things that we practiced or that you are practicing currently um, as uh, while you have a family member uh, with Renaissance Ranch, these are skills that you may have to continue to develop and even use again, um, especially even the intervening, um, you know, the intervening type skills. Uh, to those of you who have a loved one that you are currently trying to get in or, or that is maybe still out there suffering, welcome. There is hope here. There is healing here. Um, and we have answers and assistance for you. You know, I want to thank the Dixons specifically for the work that their family, and I mean that uh, all the Dixons, uh, obviously Christy and Rick are, are just spectacular, but to Tyson, Preston, and the other family members, um, I want to thank this family for the work that they do in spreading the message of hope and recovery to a population that is historically unsupported, overwhelmed, uneducated and lost that population is are you guys these loved ones of those who suffer with the disease of addiction you know i often reflect on how the trajectory of my illness and disease and the pain that my family endured at the hands of myself and of my addiction how those things may have been forestalled if i had had the resources and education that renaissance ranch and the dixons routinely provide so i want to I, I do want to acknowledge and thank them uh, for their great work. So I've been asked to speak about how I can best encourage my loved ones to seek treatment. Um, and that is, that's a wonderful topic. Uh, it's a complex topic. Um, so I want to, I want to, I'm going to kind of do what, what, what Christy has talked about, uh, what Dave has talked about. I'm going to start and what, and what uh, Christy mentioned that, uh, the, the, the model of, um, you know, uh, Al-Anon, um, the motto of Al-Anon uh, indicates, which is, um, I am going to, we are going to uh, start with me. <laughs> and that is the family member, you know, and I mean, I'm the addict, but, but you know, you, you folks are, are, are the um, family members. We're going to start there. So if you are here, for me, you know, if what you're hoping is that I'm going to teach you how you can make your family member or your loved one get treatment, what you can do to just like force them there or, or make them sign up or whatever, the obvious, quick, and short answer is you can't. Uh, many of the family members that I talk to will ask if they can bring them in against their will if we can force them into treatment. Many of the family members, I think, are hoping that there is a magic set of words or a magic set of behaviors or an equation that, that, that I can give them that if they just apply it, their family member will magically and wonderfully want to get into treatment, be motivated to get into treatment, be motivated to change and happy to change. Um, and I, I want to acknowledge that the reverent, with reverence, um, that hope and that desire, and then I want to squash it um, because, unfortunately, those words, those behaviors, those things um, don't exist. And the more that we hope to control this or force this, the more likely they are to push against that control. Very frequently, the desperation of our loved ones backfires. The last thing that I want to see when I'm sick in my disease is my wife crying and begging me because I want to run from that because I want to stay sick. And her pain is going to be met with a, a counterintuitive response from me. And that is get away from me. You know, don't, don't show me that because I'm in, as Tyson discussed, drug seeking behavior and anything that's going to, uh, uh, that anything that is going con to confound my ability to, to, uh, to seek to uh, engage in that seeking behavior, that is the behavior of seeking drugs, those things are to be fought against, rejected and avoided. Um, just like the guy at the bottom of the swimming pool Tyson spoke about that is desperate to get up. The last thing he wants to be doing is having somebody ask him how to change the light bulb down there when he's out of air. Um, so so th those magic equations um, aren't, aren't, aren't there. So the first thing that I want to discuss is uh, very much what Dave spoke about 
and that is the idea of the people in this room, the people in this um, in this seminar tonight. We are going to take responsibility for ourselves tonight, and we are going to learn, or are learning, or uh, you know, are through the Dixons and the Family Program are learning um, how to uh, more fully cut the strings of codependency, cut the strings of enmeshment and to release the desire to control. So we wanna get rid of codependency or you know, uh, minimize and eliminate as much as we can codependency and enmeshment and the desire to control. Quick resources for this one. Uh, Healing the Shame That Binds You is a book by John Bradshaw, also his video series, uh, John Bradshaw on the family. These talk about uh, the wounded child. Specifically, it could be the wounded child as the addict, but really, uh, for, for our intents and purposes, because you're the people in the room, uh, the wounded child in you. Now, that wounded child may not know how to express love and care for it, uh, its own identity. And so it gets its needs met or you get your needs met through the happiness, functionality, and success of those around you. Uh, because for whatever reason, um, you might struggle to feel whole on your own. Uh, so uh, looking into John Bradshaw and healing the shame that binds us is a wonderful, uh, a wonderful idea. I recommend the book. It's great. Uh, a, a seminal work, uh, next, a seminal work, uh, and one that uh, anybody who, who is in Al-Anon or who works with codependents will, will, uh, has probably read and can quote is Codependent No More by Melody Beatty. Spectacular book, um, teaches you about getting yourself healthy, taking care of yourself, and, 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 and breaking those, those, uh, those chains of codependency. Uh, the next thing you can do is attend the family groups with Renaissance Ranch. You are you are doing it right now, and you can do it every week. Um, that is, work on yourself. Um, as an admissions director, I very frequently have to triage, and what triaging means in the medical industry is I have to treat that which is most severe and is pr and is presenting most uh, you know most prominently, and which has the most uh, likely a chance of a positive prognosis. Very frequently, your your family members, when I speak to you, are gone. They are out. They are using. They are using. They are in their disease, or they are pre-contemplative, meaning they don't think they have a problem. They are in denial. They don't want to address the problem, um, or they do not want treatment. In that case, I, as a clinician, have to triage and I have to treat um, the presenting problem, which is you, the family member, uh, and, and the pain, hurt, suffering, and hardship that you're going through. Uh, that's not good news. That's, 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 that's not a nice thing to hear. Um, but uh, the, the good news is we have resources for you. We have these, these groups. The good news is <clears throat> that you can get help. Dave uh, Callister, who's, who, who we, we listened to first, shared with me um, uh, uh, something today uh, that a therapist of his or a friend that was a therapist once said to him, and I think it really rang true here. Here's the importance of you getting healthy. Uh, and, and it was this, this quote is directed specifically at, family, at moms and dads, but it could be uh, directed at wives. Addicts don't die on the streets. Addicts die in their parents' basement. And so it is super important that we as family members eliminate that possibility. The last thing we want to do is help our loved one die. So um, I am going to move on from addressing the family and talk about some of the things that you can do because you can do stuff as much as I may have said, hey, work on yourself and, and you know, whatever. Um, you can do things. There are certainly actions you can take. Um, first one that I've now um, covered is take care of yourself first. Get healthy. Get educated. Attend groups. The next one, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use action words to kind of link these together. Create is my next action word. Create stumbling blocks. 
Stumbling blocks are the opposite of enabling. Enabling is when you make it easier for your loved one to stay sick. Driving them places, giving them money, um, uh, you know, um, buying the car for that suicidal grandson because you love him too much to have him commit suicide. That's enabling. Stumbling blocks is not even just getting out of the way, but making it more difficult. Now, some of the, some, just so you guys know, some of the stuff that I might say isn't quite as soft and squishy and loving as Christy was. Christy gets to be the soft and squishy loving one. I'm going to be a little bit more harsh. And I am going to say love and caring don't always look nice and they won't always feel nice. They may seem shaming. They may seem mean they may seem hard sometimes us addicts need that we as the family members have to be willing to love our addict so much that we are unwilling to help them in any way get sicker or remain sick and not only that but we are willing to throw stumbling blocks in their life to create desperation in their life to hopefully help them hit some sort of a rock bottom or help them find the motivation. So how do we create stumbling blocks? My mom prayed. <laughs> and 2014, when I was out on one of my, uh, you know, my last relapse, my mom let me know in a phone call with her that she had prayed to a Heavenly Father that every single stumbling block in the world would be thrown in front of me. My mom is a person whose prayers get answered. And the next week was probably the most hellish week as an addict I have ever experienced. I was arrested. I, you know, uh, uh, OD'd, um, uh, ever, you know, got robbed, got stolen from, you know, had my car taken, had my money taken. Uh, every stumbling block that could hit me had hit me. And, and, and I believe that was in a large measure, in part, you know, if not 100% due to my mom uh, praying for stumbling blocks. If we can get our addict incarcerated, arrested, kicked out of his housing, if we can interfere with their disease, intervene on their disease and make it as much work to get high and have fun as it can be, we're doing a good job of caring for that person. It doesn't have to be fun for them. And we can certainly try and accelerate the timeline. Um, while, while the disease does have to, may have to go through what it goes through, we can speed up timelines um, for sure. And so I want to give you the permission to speed up timelines by making using miserable. The next thing is we got to, so that was create stumbling blocks, set boundaries. Okay, setting boundaries is this idea of I love you too much. I like that phrase. I teach people that phrase. I love you too much to help you continue to get sick. Therefore, if you are in your disease, I will do nothing for you. You can't come to my house. You can't call me on the phone. You can't, I won't chat with you. I won't give you money. I won't give you a place to stay. I love you too much to help you stay sick. Um, and very frequently, and, and while this is the harsh, hard way, and I understand that there very much um, that some folks may have to do half measures of this, um, do as much as you can to set hard boundaries. Those can look like, well, I probably won't have too much time for this one, but facts, feelings, and fair requests are the, uh, is the equation that I like for setting boundaries. Facts, you're using drugs and harming your family by doing it. Feelings, I feel hurt, scared, sad, and desperate when I see my family member and loved one self-destructing fair request or boundary you can't self you can't self-destruct on my watch if you're going to self-destruct you'll have to hit the streets and do it without a single thing from me um and that can be a that can be a very uh difficult thing to do but i really uh, i really encourage hard um hard fast boundaries understand that love is the operant word in tough love this is about caring for a person so much. And sometimes we have to use strong language that might even sound shaming, but it should be behavior-based. It isn't about them and who they are. 
They are amazing, wonderful, beautiful people, but they are engaged in horrible, ugly, destructive, dysfunctional um, uh, behaviors, thoughts, um, uh, you know, and actions. It's okay to call a spade a spade. That's accountability. And accountability and shame are mutually exclusive. We can talk about what side of the street, who, you know, a person's side of the street, if they are engaged in destructive, hurtful, and dysfunctional behavior, you can call it that. Um, and that is, that is okay. Um, the next thing uh, that we want to do is team up. Don't do this alone. This is, this is hard stuff. Um, go ahead and um, use family members, use friends, um, do interventions, get ecclesiastical help, get professional help. Don't try and do this alone. Get support around you. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, um, and uh, yeah, you can do it better that way. I've, I'm out of time, folks. Quick, quickly, I just want to hit two other big things. Um, acknowledge and address underlying causes and conditions and remove barrier, barriers and overcome objections. There are great ways to do those two, those last two that I'm not going to get to, but acknowledge and address underlying causes and conditions. So that means if they have something else big going on, like pain or depression or anxiety, those things need to be addressed. Removing barriers and overcoming objections is doing things like helping them get treatment set up and helping them find financing for treatment. Um, get on F MLA for work, things like that. It's okay to help them in those ways, even if it's a little bit enabling. Thank you so much for uh, listening to me, and I'm going to turn the time back over to the Dixons. Wow, wow. <clears throat> Lane, that was awesome. Sure appreciate your efforts. You know, it's nothing like hearing from an addict about, you know, uh, what an addict needs. I mean, there's nothing like it. So it's just just powerful. You know, what, what, a couple of things that hit me, Lane, about what you talked about. Uh, first off, taking care of yourself, taking care of yourself, your emotions, understanding, becoming educated. I loved also the part where you talked about creating stumbling blocks, uh, and, and that helps us not to enable. Many times we enable the addiction, and we don't know that we are enabling the addiction. So, Lane, really appreciate that. Um, real quick to the audience, hey, um, we are, I'm going to say a few words and then we're going to switch over to, to question and answers. Uh, submit some questions that you would like answered. And uh, we'll uh, uh, have our panelists um, uh, 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 answer those questions as best we can and uh, rock and roll, okay? So start submitting your, your questions as, as many and as soon as you can and uh, we'll go from there. All right, I've got a PowerPoint. We're just uh, uploading it now, um, and it's got a video. So you're going to see a video, and um, you're also going to be able to uh, uh, see a PowerPoint. So, uh, Lane, I not, need to rely on you a little bit because we're kind of newbies at this. What, what are you seeing? Oh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. It looks, it looks great. So we're seeing your, your PowerPoint. You need to put on the full screen mode, but it uh, looks good. So on the display settings, do your presenter mode there. Okay. I, I, yep. All right. There, there we you go. go. Perfect. Good deal. Good deal. Okay. Uh, so um, I've got two screens. So if I'm kind of wiggling around, you'll know, you'll know why. Um, uh, let's talk about finding peace in the, fa in the family in reference to recovery. Um, and, you know, Many of you are in a situation where you're saying, what do I do? Because I really don't know what to do. A crisis happens, something comes up, and you kind of feel alone. I want you to look at this video and liken it unto what's happened, somebody in your family or your relationship or with your loving addict. Um, I'm going to talk over this a little bit, but what we experienced in uh, – with our two boys in addiction was this. Uh, this is a hell storm. Uh, these balls of hell are the size of a tennis ball. And things were nice a couple of minutes before this, but all of a sudden, crisis happens. All of a sudden, your whole world changes. All of a sudden, you're saying, how can this happen? 
to my family. And then you start having your emotional windshield busted up, right? Uh, you, you stop because you really don't believe this is happening. You're going, you got to be kidding me. What did I do to deserve this? How can this happen to me? Why is this happening to me? And, and not only is this happening to you, you see that it happens to your relationships. You see that what happens is that it creates crisis after crisis after crisis. Can you put that back on for a minute, huh? And so what's happening is uh, uh, you don't really know what to do. And, and things are hitting you the size of a tennis ball and uh, literally knocking holes out of the back windows of your emotional bank account. Literally knocking your side view mirrors off, right? And not only is it affecting you, it affects all aspects of your family. It affects your work. It affects those around you. All kinds of things. And then when you just have a minute to take your head up for some air, you look at this and you look at the damage. You look at what, what crises have happened and you look at the devastation around you. If this is how you're feeling right now or have feel, felt, I want to validate your feelings because this is exactly where we were. This is exactly how we felt. This is exactly where we were. You know, um, I remember one time when one of our boys was in uh, jail. Now, this is not him, but this depicts exactly what I saw. I remember going to visit him. He was in a, 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 a orange jumpsuit, uh, had, um, was, was shackled up. He would uh, hardly be able to shuffle because the shackles were so tight and it just broke my heart. I thought, what has happened to our family? What's happened to my boy? He was supposed to be about 185 pounds and when we saw him in jail, because we hadn't seen him for a while, he was pushing maybe 125 or 130 pounds. And he was in shackles. And he was hurting physically, he was hurting emotionally, and it was just a devastating thing. You know, it's one thing to see our addicts hurting, and they are hurting. They really are in all aspects. But in addiction, you as the codependent are hurting as well in many ways. As I remember as we went through this, the anger that we had, uh, the anger towards God, the anger that I had towards uh, our boys, the anger towards my wife. What was interesting is that we were looking at this differently. I was a tough love. She was kind of, you know, uh, enabling a bit. I was mad at her. She was mad at me. There was a lot of anger in the home. I was embarrassed because we'd raised our kids with, with, um, we thought values. We took them to church. We uh, taught them to pray. And I was embarrassed because of what was happening in our family. A lot of resentment towards the boys, and they felt that. It was really, really a difficult time with a lot of emotional hailstorms going on all around our relationships. What was interesting is that as we got into treatment, as we got into working our own recovery, we learned that shame oftentimes is the core center of all addiction. Shame is the driver of addiction. So what exactly is this idea called shame? Well, if it's the core center of addiction, if this is the driver of addiction, what is it? Why is it? How can I help if I'm a, a, a family member? We learned that shame is emotional heart disease. Shame is emotional bleeding. Cravings almost always, always, always come from emotional bleeding from the shame, which causes emotional wounds. 
we learn that shame is different than guilt. Guilt is good. Shame is not good. Guilt is, comes from our Heavenly Father. Guilt is, boy, I did something wrong. I can make it better. Shame is, I am wrong. And there's no way I can make myself better. And what's his self hatred? It's it's deep pain, and an addict will use their drug of choice to numb out this pain, this emotional upheaval. That's why they call addiction the feelings disease, because an addict will numb out these feelings through their pain of choice. Um, here's kind of an analogy. Uh, if you look at a at a, at a dandelion, the flower is the addiction. The root is the shame. See, the flower is what you see. That is not the problem. The addiction isn't, it, 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 it makes problems, but it isn't the problem. The root, the shame, those issues is what's driving that flower of addiction. And so the root cause need to be addressed. And that's um, what happens in treatment. That's what happens with the 12 steps. That's what happens with counseling. And that's also what happens when family, family members become involved in uh, treatment. Let me show you a picture of what shame looks like. Okay, imagine in your mind what shame looks like. This is what shame looks like. This young man is saying to himself, I'm a worthless piece of junk. I hate myself. I don't, I know other people don't like me. I, I'm, I'm worthless. That's what shame looks like. Here's another picture of shame. See what this young man is saying? You know what? I can't trust myself. How could anybody else trust me? Here's another example. He can't even look his spouse in the eye. He's saying, I can't trust myself. How could God or how could you ever trust me? Here's another scenario. He's saying, why am I like this? I'm worthless. No wonder addicts at times want to take their lives. And because of the shame of going to their addiction and the shrapnel that it causes, it's a cyclical scenario where then they go back to their addiction to numb out the pain of what they just recently caused and then it just continues and then the shame is over and over again the question that i had in our family was if shame is the core center of addiction how did i do it did i add to this because we learned that um, as as family members we don't cause it we can't cure it, but what I did learn is that we can contribute to it. And here's some examples of shame and a, some things that we were doing that I was doing in our family. See, we had this little religious family, right? And we'd take them to church. We'd sit on the first or second roll. Uh, even when we went on vacations, we'd take them to church. We made sure we prayed morning and night. We had family home evenings, all of these things, but it was a shame-based family. It was a scenario where it was, a, it was the traditions of our fathers, and many families are like this. Things are passed down, and what causes shame and emotional um, uh, issues is, is, is these things listed. For example, criticism. Hey, son. Um, if you want to be anybody, you better shape up. You can't live a life like that. Uh, you you got to get a job. Are you just going to live on the street and be a bum? See, criticism, criticism, rejection. You know what? You, you do that kind of stuff, you're going to lose all your friends. Is that what you want? Uh, judgment. You know what? If you dress like that, um, you're going to attract people you don't want to be. Or what are you thinking? Ridicule. Man, you keep doing that, you're going to be under the bridge warming your hands on a fire. Is that what you want? Here's, here's a big one. Emotional abandonment. 
the thing that drives shame the worst, particularly with a father and a son, is emotional abandonment. And I want to give you an example of actually what happened with Tyson. Um, I think he'd be okay with me sharing this. One day, uh, the uh, evening before, um, something had happened and it was not right and I was not pleased at all. And I was upset. I wasn't happy. He knew it. The next morning, and he's, I'm guessing, maybe 18 years old or something like this, okay? We didn't know that they were in opiates at this point, but something was going on. We couldn't put our hands on it. But man, there was hell going around down all over the place in, 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 our, in, our, in our family, in our lives. And the night before this thing that happened, I was not happy. Well, I wasn't happy. Well, that next morning, I'm in the kitchen. He comes up in the kitchen. And, and I'm upset still, but I say nothing. I, I didn't want him to think it was okay. So I emotionally shunned him. It was like we're in the same room, but we're Grand Canyons apart. I, I didn't even really acknowledge him. I didn't want to show care to him because I was mad. I wanted to teach him, right? What really I was doing and I learned this later, is that I emotionally abandoned him. He's already feeling, you know what? I, I, I'm just really a piece of work. My dad do, doesn't even care about me. Obviously, I'm worthless. And that just drives the addiction further. He just wants to go use after I emotionally ban, abandoned him. Comments like should have, name calling, uh, comments labeling. You know, uh, uh, you look like a bum. Uh, you look like X or whatever. Um, comparison. You know, why don't you do what your sister's doing? Grow up a little. Comparing, just drive shame. Belittling, things like this. Facial and hand expressions. I don't know, you probably see just me on a small bit, but facial and hand expression. Body language can shame a person more than anything else that I just went over. For example, in looking at times, and I feel so bad about this with my sons, and I was disgusted and I wanted to try to quote unquote motivate them to do better, but I was just doing the opposite. I would um, use body language like this. I'd look at them, discuss it, I'd throw my hands up, and I'd go like this, and I'd walk away. Those types of things cause major shame. And I had to recover from, from being the head of a shame-based family. And that's what the 12 steps did for me. It was very, very powerful. Um, you know, family and friends also suffer from obsessive behaviors, persecuting behaviors, enabling behaviors. Um, we talked a lot about in the last, uh, with a lot, uh, last few speakers enabling. There's two things that make addiction worse. Two things. One is using, but number two is a family me member enabling. And so becoming educated on what is enabling and what is truly helping is very critical. And so very important that, uh, in our recovery, we do that. Um, you know, my wife and I, as we were going through this, she thought one thing, I thought another. And this is how we felt. This is not us, but this is a picture that truly depicted really how we felt. And, um, it, you know, as your other kids, uh, they see what's happening and they feel the stress in the family. This is why I found the best thing that I could do was to work on my own recovery. All I wanted was peace. All I wanted was a good relationship with my wife. I wanted a good relationship with the rest of my kids and family. And, um, you know, to, 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 to end before our question and answers, let me tell you when everything changed. When everything changed. When I started going in and working my own recovery, all of a sudden, the two by four plank came out of my eyes, and I saw, you know what? I had a part in this. I really did. 
And I remember um, Ty was in the Renaissance Ranch and it was about the third week. We just went into an education class and I was starting to get it. And I remember walking out, we had a few minutes with uh, our loving addicts in, in the ranch and I was able to take a few minutes and Ty referred to it. It's interesting in his comments, he referred to it because I was gonna to refer to it as well. But I remember going up to him and saying, you know, Ty, I'm proud of you, man. This is a beast. This, I had no idea that this was a brain disease and affected a person like they did. I'm just so grateful that uh, you've chosen to be in, in, into recovery. But you know what? I apologize. I've done a lot of things that have shamed. I've done a lot of things that have caused some great, great problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to work on myself. That's when our relationship changed. And from that point on, he never used again. And it wasn't because our relationship all of a sudden was mended, but it was a starting and everything changed. That's why I believe the best thing that we can do for our loved one is to work on our own recovery. Well, um, so what should we do when we work on a, uh, when, when our loved one is in addiction is again to work on our own recovery. It, it's just my testimony and belief that the best thing we can do for our loved ones is to engage in recovery. And uh, it's powerful and important. Can you put me back on there, hun? No, we're out of time, honey. We gotta go to the uh, Q&A. Well, no, I got a couple other things. Can you put that back up? I've gotta show them a couple other slides. Okay. Okay, so um, the resources, just in ending here, because my, my wife's the boss, as you can see, and she's really policing me. And so uh, she's not enabling me to go over, right? But um, the, uh, here's some of the greatest resources that, that we could share with you. The Renaissance Ranch Public Family Education classes. They're online. I'll show you. You want to get your camera or your, your, your phone and take a picture of this just in a second. They're all free. We've got three a week. They're free. Join with us. Also, the book, the workbook, uh, Healing Through Christ, powerful. And um, uh, we'll have that in uh, up in just a second. And then also get involved in a community 12-based program, either through Al-Anon or the ARP Addiction Recovery Program. Very, very powerful. This is the Healing Through Christ book. You can go healingthroughchrist.org and order it yourself on that. And this is what you want to take a picture with your... Uh, phone real quick, or you can go to renaissanceranch.org and uh, pull it off their website under the family program. And please join us. We have 90 families a week that's been on with us, and we would like 190. Join with us as, as, as soon as you can, as often as you can. We love you guys. Appreciate you guys. And so um, uh, with that, this is our family. This is all our kids and their spouses. All five of our kids are married. We have 11 grandbabies. Here are seven of them. And uh, the other four came quick and too quick. We didn't get a picture. But uh, just so grateful to be with you. Let's go to question and answers at this point. And, um, and can you pull that up, hon? And, yeah. And. Okay. All right. You know, why, why uh, we're pulling up the questions. Let me, uh, Lane. Um, can you uh, address this question? Can you unmute yourself for a second? And okay, we've got a question that came in, and it was basically this: My daughter, is she she's in her early twenties. She's living at her house. Uh, she's using. She doesn't have a job. She stays, uh, you know, in during the day, and 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 just is secluded in her bedroom, isolates. Uh, she doesn't eat a whole lot, doesn't contribute to the family. Then at night she goes out and drinks and uses. We don't know right where she is. Sometimes she doesn't come home. Sometimes she does. And then she comes back home and, you know, we love her. We don't want her to die, but what are we supposed to do when we've got a, 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 a daughter in that scenario? Uh, maybe what we can do is Lane have you address this, and then Tyson, 
Can you also address this after Lane does? Lane? Yep, so very briefly, this is an adult child? Yes. Yep. Set and boundaries and kick them out. You know, if they can't follow the if they can't follow the rules, if they are using and, and you have a house rule of not using, um, you're more than welcome to have that. Um, uh, if if you don't want somebody who is at, who is act, who is sick and unhealthy in your home, I recommend that that, that you um, uh, tell them that. And if they can't change the behavior, that you you know tell them to to pay for and, and get their own place and they can do whatever they'd like in that. I know that sounds cold and it's easier said than done, but there's no reason that, that, that we have to, and again, that's a, it's a perfect example of enabling. They've got a nice place to stay. They've got a nice room to go to. They get to sleep during the day. Why wouldn't they keep being dysfunctional? We're making it super easy for them. See, that's what's called enabling. Until the pain and the consequences greater than going into recovery, they won't go into recovery because in their mind, they don't have a problem. They don't feel the pain. They don't see the consequence. Well, well done. Uh, Tyson, are you there? Can you, uh, pi yeah. he's, he's probably done to, there he is. Oh yeah. Okay. You don't have to send me, uh, the, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, what was the question? Well, the question is you've got a, a, a 23 year old, uh, woman, uh, a daughter that's living at home. She is not, uh, she's working, she's using, she isolates during the day, uses at night, sometimes come home, sometimes doesn't, not contributing to the family. What are the parents to do? Well, you had me at she's 23 and she's living at home. <laughs> um, you know, this is hard, like, is it, has anyone ever had a job where they have to say the same things over and over and over and over and over and over and over again? Um, and that, that's, um, uh, you know, what the bottom line is, is going back to the needs, food, water, air, drugs. If, um, if, if you, if, if you allow them other needs to be satiated so they can obtain their drugs, then you are a part of the, the problem. And meaning, because if, if the addict does not get to the place where they fit, they, they feel the gravity of their consequences, they won't think to change. Their disease is so loud and so encompassing and so big that the only thing that they will hear is the ac actions taken and boundaries constantly reinforced. Then they have their food, water, shelter taken away and, and try to get drugs, all of that. If the drink, continue to live. When, the, you and and you continue to hit that boundary of not being allowed in the home, not continue to be um, given this substance all the time. Um, at least for me, um, and countless others, when I, when 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 my parents took that stance and that boundary with me, yet had love and patience with me, in that if you're clean and sober and and you're working on your recovery, you can then. Stay here. Then we can give you food, water, and shelter. Um, if not, they have food, water, and shelter at the homeless shelter. Mm -hmm. They do. And I'm, I'm like, bull crap. You're not going to let me do that. We, you know, um, it's like that's you know. And so I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go and I'm going to try to go run amok with friends and this and that. And um, it, you know, it, it took a, a year or two before before I. Um, what happened is the disease escalated, uh, and then I knew my parents were safe to go to tell the truth to. So when I was ready to change, right, or they, there was a, a time where, where they sat me down and said, look, we, we know that you're using, it's pretty obvious. We don't care. We care about you. Do, do you want to get help? We will help you get out of this crap you know and I, and I didn't lose I hadn't lost anything at this point this is before, right before I came to the ranch I still had a vehicle I had a place to live 
I was just miserable and unhappy. Um, and my parents having that boundary, you know, having the next place to go and I'm left to myself and my own resources, my own, my own intelligence, which was dramatically um, futile against managing my disease and being an adult. Um, so the, the, the alcoholic addict, in order to continue to use, they must be enabled in order for that to happen. Because they will get to the place where they're so unable to manage their life, to generate income, um, because they will be so despondent from reality and or the ability to provide for themselves, where <clears throat> they will eventually uh, need to choose to get, to get help. But they will never even close to get to that point if they have a nice, cushy place, food, water, and shelter to be at. So <clears throat> we most of the calls that come in, and I know Lane can attest to this, most of the calls that come in are family members with their the addicted loved one living in their home, in their they're supporting their we want to help them, but they're caught in a rock and a hard place because we're the best manipulators in the world. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Confirmed. <laughs> you know, you guys, uh, it's, I know what, what some family members are thinking. They're thinking, man, I can't just kick them out. Well, because you, you, you're thinking, boy, they can't just go on the streets. That's terrible. One thing that makes it easy, easier is for, for, to know where they can go and to let them know. Here's where you can go. You can give them a transient bishop downtown, his number, and they have three meals a day. And they can have a place to sleep every night. It's not like they're out on the streets and can't get food. So, you know, it, it, it's, I think it's important. You can say tough things in, in great love. Yeah. And, and, and Dad, I think, I think someone ha gave a question before we get too far away from what you were talking about. I really liked their question. And it might be good to kind of respond because it kind of goes along with what you were just saying here. Um, let me find it here. I wanted to address the one on the young siblings in the home as well. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get to yep. that here in yeah, just a second. Really want to cover That's that. good. The, the example of uh, when Tyson came upstairs um, with the Grand Canyon, emotional distance, what would have been a healthy way to, to answer that? She says, I would be interested in an example of a better way to handle that, situa that situation with Tyson in the morning. Uh, right, the emotional abandonment. Okay, th this is how it, I've relived that a thousand times in my uh, 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 over the l last several years. You know what I would have done is when he come up, came up, I would have sat down kneecap to kneecap to him and put my hand on his shoulder and say, Ty, I've been thinking all night and morning about this. I want you to know how much. I love you. No matter what you did or no matter what you ever do, my love as a father for you will never, ever, ever change. I love you so much. I was frustrated and still am about what happened last night. And we've set some parameters, but just know that, man, I love you. You're an incredible individual. And this is why, Ty. And I've named it off three or four, and I won't take the time now, of things why I love him. Because the night before, I took his windpipe out and beat him with it, figuratively speaking, right? But this morning, I want to take and show him an extra amount of love, extra amount of support, extra amount of emotion, and tell him all the things about him that are incredible, so unique to him. And then in that me in the kitchen, Spend time with him. Spend time loving on him. Spend time talking with him. Spend time, what you're going to do today. Okay, Ty. And then let's make sure last night what happened okay. doesn't happen again. That type of thing. Okay. So uh, thank you for that question. All righty. And uh, we're getting close to our time. I apologize. We're going a little bit over. We were a little slow starting. But there is a question that young siblings, um, this this person has five young siblings that are witnessing the addicted loved ones 
behaviors? Um, how should this be approached? They see it, but they don't understand it. There's no way to really explain it in a reasonable way, is there? And and I, for for me as a mom, I when the siblings are eight, what, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. And once I was in recover, once I was in recovery, it really helped me to know how to have a vocabulary to talk about these things. And I just helped the younger siblings understand that they ha they have a disease right now. They have disease with their brain, just like when you get sick and you can't stop coughing, they can't stop. They can't stop their their brain problems. The choices they're making are affected with the brain. So we we were taught, you know, teach them addictions is chronic, it's progressive. But this is one thing that helped me in Stephen R. Covey's book too. Is I used to feel guilty, like, oh my gosh, I'm spending all this time with the loved ones with addiction, and maybe the younger kids are getting resentful. Or so what he explained was when a parent goes after the one that is struggling it actually sends a message to the, to the other children in the family of, um, of uh, what's the word, uh, comfort. And it, it comforts them in knowing that if I, maybe if I'm ever struggling, then my parents will come after me and help me like they're helping them. So it's actually a, a big source of, of, I can't think of the word, but it's of, of comfort and solace and, and stability for our younger kids. So again, we just refer to it as a disease because that's what it is. Mm -hmm. So, okay. and I want to thank Preston really quickly. You guys can see Preston. Um, he's the one that set up this whole webinar. He's our chief operational officer. He set up, he'll send out some polling questions after that will really need your help in knowing how we can improve upon this in the future. And we just thank you for, for putting up with us. And, and, and uh, this is, we're so excited for this and so grateful for your support. And, and we'll pray for you and your families and feel free to reach out to us at renaissanceranch.com. Just click on the family program schedule. Any other burning yeah, we, questions? We have, we have one more quick? question okay. here. Let, let me uh, uh, read the question. And then uh, Tyson, uh, can you address this? And, uh, oh, he's got the cowboy hat on. <laughs> I love it. Okay, here's the question. If we know our addict is lying to us, how do we confront that without adding shame? So uh, there, there's Ty with Valor. And uh, I had uh, Valor and Grace and uh, Radden today. I took them out to a dinosaur museum and we had some fun and bought them a little cowboy hat. So kind of fun. But anyway, so, so uh, Ty, can you address that? You've got a, a scenario where, you know, yeah. you know, the addict is lying. How do you confront it without shaming the addict? Um, <clears throat> the first thing that, that comes to mind is, uh, I mean, you, you guys really know how to, how to answer this. I mean, and, and that's, you, you, um, uh, you don't, you don't, um, you don't call out that behavior directly at them to them in that moment. What you want to do is, fo you know, is to not, to focus on positive, not, um, what, what not to do or what they are doing that is wrong, but um, what's, you know, how, you know, how can I help make healthy decisions? And, you know, the, there's always going to be a part of what they need that is healthy um, that you want to focus on and nurture and encourage um, and support. Um, because uh, there a lot of times we have parts of us where our disease is calling most of the shots 90% of the time. 10% of the time, we might get honest and vulnerable. We might ask for a little help. We, we might be um, it, uh, in a place for that to happen. Um, so <clears throat> instead of in the place of how do I react in the situation without shaming, there needs to be many more instances preceding that moment in which they feel safe around you and not judged um and and um uh and supported and and, and, and that can be a very long process because at first it can they can seem very um like lane was saying i gotta see my little guy yeah <laughs> Here, let me, I want to compliment what Tyson is saying and just to add one little bit to it. So, uh, you know, two things. One, um, uh, I like what Tyson is saying. 
this disease is going to have a lot of ugly symptoms that are a part of it. And we don't need to focus on like pointing out all of those symptoms. You lie, you cheat, you steal. They know they lie, they cheat, and they steal. I don't know that it helps us that much to point those things out. Um, and so to what, to, to the extent that the disease comes with a bunch of ugly behaviors that encapsulate it, um, you know, you, you can pick and choose your battles on that. You certainly don't have to do a, do a recounting because that will just end up being shaming and it won't really achieve anything. The flip side of that is, you know, feel free to be honest about behaviors. When we're talking about behaviors, we want to take the shame language out of it, like labeling and calling them a liar. But certainly, if, if it's important and needs to be discussed, we can say, I don't believe you right now. I, I feel like you're being honest. I, I think you're being dishonest with me, or I know you're being dishonest with me. I understand that's a part of your disease, but I don't appreciate it. And I'm going to disengage from this conversation if we can't have an honest one. We can set boundaries about, uh, about unacceptable behaviors, and we can call Un, un, unhealthy behaviors what we see them as we can say you're being you know you're being dishonest right now you are you know you're doing x y and z i saw this i know this and you know it's not up for debate and i understand it and that's okay i still love you i always will but it's not okay and if you're going to keep lying to me i'm disengaging from the conversation because i love you too much to participate in your dysfunction mm -hmm. thank you Thank you so much. Thank you, Lane. Um, <clears throat> guys, we're out of time. I, give me 30 seconds and we'll wrap this up. Let me try to get inside your heart for just a minute. Um, addiction in our family um, was probably the second greatest thing that's ever happened to me in my life. She's the first greatest thing. But addiction truly is the, the second biggest thing because it's done for me incredible things. We didn't like the dark abyss and all that and the shrapnel, but what the recovery has been has been incredible. And people often ask, what is the 12 steps? What is, why is that so important? Why is the 12 steps so powerful? The 12 steps for me were a practical application of accessing the atoning power of Jesus Christ to help change me where I could not change myself. That's what made all the difference. Let me just close by reading Holy Writ out of the scriptures. Listen to this, talking about Jesus Christ. And he shall go forth suffering pains and afflictions and temptations of every kind. And this, that the word might be fulfilled, which saith he will take upon him the pains and the sicknesses of his people. And he will take upon him their infirmities, which is our weaknesses, that his bowels may be filled with mercy according to the flesh, that he may know according to the flesh how to succor and help his people according to their infirmities. The Savior went through, and many of us, and I at times, said, why? Nobody can understand this. Why is this happening to me, to my family? Nobody understands. And truly, maybe many didn't understand. But I believe our Savior fully understands. And the 12 steps for me was emotional repentance, was a spiritual journey, was an incredible opportunity for me to have him change me in areas where I could not change myself. That's what's in store for you. That's the journey. That's the peace, the comfort that can come from your own recovery. So with that, Lane, could you uh, give us a closing prayer real quick, brother? And um, we will uh, wrap it up. And, and, and feel free to reach out to us. If you have any questions, you can email me at christine at renaissanceranch.com. And um, and we'll do this again. Thank you so much. Lane? Thank you, Lane. Sure. Thank you. Our dear kind Heavenly Father, as we uh, come to the, the end of this family seminar, our hearts are full with the, the hope and uh, education and inspiration that um, we've heard here today. And uh, Father, it's our sincere prayer that, uh, that um, as the families of, of addicted individuals, we can find health, strength, and support um, and, uh, and maybe even a better and 
a more full, honest, authentic way to live uh, through this process uh, that we can get healthy ourselves. Father, at this time, we also ask a special blessing on the addict who still suffers. Uh, may they experience the motivation, the stumbling blocks, and the difficulties necessary to, uh, to recognize their problem and seek treatment. Um, and Father, just uh, watch over all of us and, and, uh, and uh, as we go through this process of, of healing and recovery, that we'll feel thy healing hand uh, involved in, the, in our day-to-day -day lives is our humble prayer. Thank you for these speakers uh, and for this message and for these family members. Uh, say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.